Thank you, Philip. It's a pleasure to be here uh, presenting a paper that touches very much uh, the main uh, objective of the, of the conference, uh, the effects of tighter regulatory requirements on bank profitability and risk-taking incentives. So yes, the paper is about that. And the paper is also about systemic risk. Uh, in fact, it's a paper about systemic risk taking and how capital requirements might help in reducing banks' systemic risk taking. There is a growing literature trying to introduce uh, banks into a macro setup, uh, in particular connected to the efforts to define uh, new macroprudential policies after the diagnosis that perhaps before this long financial crisis, the emphasis was too much on microprudential regulation and supervision of banks uh, rather than macroprudential, with that meaning that we were neglecting the aggregate implications of the micro banking uh, features. And the, the common example as a motivation for this is that it is not the same having a system where each bank has a 1% a probability of default. If default across banks is IID, as if uh, the 1% probability of default at individual banks goes with, but when one bank fails, all banks fail. If these defaults are perfectly correlated across banks, I'm going to the extreme, then a 1% probability of bank failure, which the microprudential supervisors might consider adequate, is really too risky for the economy. Because, you know, also applying some long, law of large numbers reasoning, you might say that on average once in a 100 years, you will have the full collapse of the financial system. And that can be quite costly for, for the economy. Now, uh, systemic risk is very much about system collapse, and uh, there are still no, uh, uh, even I would say, a number of well-identified consensual notions of what systemic risk means, and less uh, endogenous systemic risk. And this paper is just a modest attempt, a first step in the direction of trying to have a model-based notion of systemic risk and incorporate that into an analytical framework that hopefully could be uh, useful for analyzing either macroprudential policies or standard uh, regulatory uh, tools. And in fact, this paper is more about the standard regulatory tools. We are going to focus on the effects of capital requirements. The very specific notion that we take in this uh, paper for systemic risk is essentially what results from banks' voluntary exposure to a large, infrequent common shock. So it's a common shock that if banks are really exposed to, to it, will make the banks go bankrupt, to make the story short. And, 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 and to build this endogenous risk taking, BAB, the big uh, common shock, we build on insights from, uh, I would say, the standard risk taking incentives uh, at banks, uh, micro literature that has been there for, uh, I would say, 20, 30 years now. Uh, especially after the, the US savings and loans crisis in the 80s, many papers were emphasizing how limited liability uh, and uh, either implicit or explicit warranties from governments uh, make banks uh, potentially interested in gambling with their uh, depositors or other financiers uh, uh, money given that uh, basically their losses in uh, the losses of the bank owners in case of uh, bank failure are limited but the potential gains from the upside are, are quite high. So, so I'm going to uh, present the, the, the results and the insight of a macro paper that builds quite heavily on uh, intuitions that we have from the micro literature on boundary staking. 
a literature, by the way, that already identified the role of uh, bank capital requirements in reducing, uh, in reducing uh, risk-taking incentives. So the nature of the contribution is, is more at the level of introducing these insights in a simple dynamic equilibrium model and interpreting the usual risk-taking by an individual bank here as individual banks have to decide whether to expose themselves or not to an aggregate risk, to a, what we call a sy systemic risk. And, and, and a systemic risk that when it realizes uh, has effects at the general equilibrium uh, level. We model bank capital dynamics like in other papers in the literature, basically as the limited wealth of a special class of agents that we call the bankers or the bank shareholders, uh, which is a way to incorporate a clear friction in the evolution of bank capital in the economy. Bank capital in our model builds up uh, from the retention of earnings by the existing bankers. And if the existing bankers uh, lose a lot of their capital due to uh, bad luck, due to bad realization of their past investments, then the economy suffers a capital crunch. And until the agents in this model that are called the bankers uh, uh, generate new earnings so as to accumulate new capital, uh, the economy may suffer a, a credit crunch. Actually, you might wonder, well, if capital is scarce in this economy, what is good about capital requirements? Well, capital requirements are going to link the existing capital to the aggregate level of credit in the economy. So tightening the capital requirements, given the amount of capital in the system, is going to reduce the supply of credit, which might sound uh, uh, not necessarily good per se. Um, but what is important in the, in, the, in the model is that eventually the capital requirements have also an impact on the risk taking uh, uh, implicit in the credit that the, banks, uh, that the banks provide to the economy. They have this crucial choice between making credit in a systemic manner, which means in a manner which makes those loans exposed to the infrequent large common shock and makes those loans default uh, in a, a very correlated manner uh, uh, from time to time. Or banks can also choose to make their credit uh, less systemic, to make their credit, if you wish, and actually in the, in the context of the paper, in the form of loans whose default is IID, is independently uh, identically distributed, but what is really important there is independently distributed, so that then by diversification, when the banks make non-systemic non uh, credit, then they, they are immune to the big shock that happens only uh, very, very, very rarely, but that when happens is potentially uh, devastating. Uh, Although in the micro literature there were many papers emphasizing the role of bank capital in reducing gambling incentives, what is new of this paper is to put it in the context of the macro analysis and uh, to talk about systemic gambling incentives rather than idiosyncratic uh, gambling in incentives. Um, I will anticipate that in the model increasing capital requirements reduces bankers' systemic risk-taking, but it also increases uh, the tightness of, of the implicit limits to the credit supply, so that has a potentially negative impact on aggregate economic activity, which means that from a social welfare point of view, the, uh, there is an optimal level of capital requirements, trading off sort of gains on the risk-taking dimension with losses on the aggregate economic activity that banks in the economy are able to sustain. Let me give you the, the, the insights after uh, talking briefly about the ingredients of the model. So we, we consider a, a, a macro model uh, where production takes the usual form, is, is the result of combining uh, uh, physical capital and labor to produce output, 
but, but, the, but the, the, the firms need bank loans to pay for their factors of production in advance. So there will be a tight linkage between uh, production and, and whether bank loans pay or not pay. So we consider production technologies subject to failure risk, and the failure of these production technologies can be out of an, an initial choice of whether this production technology is systemic or non-systemic. The production uh, failure risk can be purely IID, in which case, basically, the bank is giving loans to non-systemic firms. And by the law of large numbers, the portfolio of loans the bank makes to these firms is pretty safe. Or production can be highly correlated, uh, uh, may face highly correlated uh, uh, failure risk uh, if, if uh, these are uh, systemic firms. So in systemic firms, if the, if the rare shock realizes production fails and the recovery of physical capital after production is very low. Um, and, and this will eventually mean that uh, bank loans uh, uh, default. Firms need bank loans. Lending to systemic firms is socially inefficient. We, we assume, just as in the literature on excessive risk taking, that uh, the systemic risk involve an element of gambling, but that means uh, actually lower expected returns, but conditional on success, the, re the returns are higher there. So that, that establishes the temptation for banks to actually give loans to systemic firms, but systemic uh, production uh, on average produces less than non-systemic production. But the combination of high leverage and limited liability by banks may, makes them uh, willing to go for that inefficient mode of, of lending. The banks in our model are subject to capital requirements, but quite importantly, whether banks are lending to systemic firms or to non-systemic firms is not observable to the regulator, because otherwise, given that we assume that systemic lending to systemic firms is socially inefficient, a regulator should impose prohibitively high capital requirements to the banks giving loans to the systemic firms. And that will be the end of the story. But, but we think that this is private information. Only when the big shock realizes, we notice which banks were exposed to the systemic uh, firms. Right? So in the case of Spain and the recent crisis, the systemic firms were the real estate developers. But maybe in some other crisis, it's something else. Right? In the case of real estate, actually, there is something too, too repetitive in history. So maybe we should consider that an observable category of, of systemic lending. But, but in terms of the model, uh, we, we consider systemic versus non-systemic, non-observable ex ante, except for the banks and the firms involved, involved in it. And hence, the, the type of capital requirement we are talking about in the paper is a flat capital requirement that obliges the bank owners to contribute more capital to the lending, right? So it's a sort of uh, a skin in the game uh, first uh, aspect of that capital requirements uh, involve. These capital requirements are satisfied with inside equity, which, I, as I said, is the wealth of the so-called bankers uh, in the economy. And this is a dynamic economy, so the bankers uh, determine their capital over time through the retention of the earnings that they obtain on, on their past investments. Just to close the dynamics, some bankers stop being bankers, if you wish, retire, and some new bankers come in, and that is model like in say, in, in Gerler and Kiyotaki and other famous papers in this, in this area. I'm going to show uh, most of the results of the paper in graphical form in, in a couple of slides uh, from now. But I want to introduce uh, what you will see in the, in the graphs. So the model is constructed to remain extremely simple. So although it's a completely dynamic, stochastic, uh, general equilibrium uh, model in infinite horizon, we build things so linearly that eventually the only state variable to care about is bankers' aggregate wealth E. This is the wealth that the bankers at a given point in time can possibly invest as equity in the so-called banks. 
Notice that if, if the capital requirement is, is lambda and these people's wealth is E, basically loans in the economy will be E divided by gamma. Uh, this E grows quickly if bank profits are high. But imagine all banks have invested in a systemic way and the systemic shock realizes. Then a lot of this E is washed away after the shock. And then the amount of loans that can be made in the next period are very, very, very few. So this is a big credit crunch. This is a systemic crisis in, in our economy. But in our economy, the banks can decide to make the loans non-systemic. And if they make the loans non-systemic, they don't lose their equity if the systemic shock comes. There are two important endogenous variables, which is B of E, this is the value of one unit of this scarce resource. It's the shadow value of a scarce resource in the economy. It's also how much a banker will be willing to pay for getting one more uh, unit of funds so as to use those funds as, as equity in, in its bank to expand its lending. And the second important variable is XE. This summarizes the portfolio decision of the bankers which fraction of the E at a given point in time they want to invest in systemic uh, loans. And actually in the logic of limited liability and full exploitation of the, of the limited liability effects, when these bankers decide to go for systemic lending, they put systemic lending in a specialized banks. So there will be a specialized systemic lenders and a specialized non-systemic lenders. And the systemic banks then will collapse when the systemic shock realizes. So XI will be the fraction of banks in the system or the fraction of equity in the system lost if the systemic shock realizes. Now, increasing capital requirements will be good for the incentives via B systemic risk taking for a standard reasons Higher uh, capital requirements means lower leverage. Lower leverage, in general, means lower incentives to gamble. But on top of that, in this dynamic model, there are uh, dynamic incentives associated to what in a paper with Perotti in 2008, we were calling the last bank standing effect. The banks in this economy, the bankers in this economy are operating over time. If a banker thinks that all his colleagues are investing their equity in a systemic manner, that banker will know that if the systemic shock realizes, all his competitors will lose their equity. And he will be the survivor if he's not systemic with that. That provides great incentives for bankers to deviate from other bankers who are sort of investing in a systemic manner. So it could be that given the parameters in the model, in a purely static thinking, these bankers will maximize the one period profits by all of them going into systemic lending. But given the last bank standing effect, bankers will deviate from that on the purpose of appropriating the huge scarcity rents earned by the surviving bank capital once the systemic shock realizes. We eventually analyze the welfare involved in the choice of higher capital requirements. Higher capital requirements is going to be good for incentives, but it's going to be bad for credit supply. Because remember, credit supply is E divided gamma. When we increase the gamma, we improve the composition of bank loans towards less systemic and more non-systemic. But we are making E divided gamma lower. And this is credit supply. And in this model, this is aggregate economic activity. It is employment, it is, it is output. Well, actually, it's a model without unemployment, but it's essentially output and physical investment that is to be lost when capital requirements are high. Now, given the trade-offs, we find under some calibration that I will skip describing here, but you can find in the paper that social welfare is maximized at an interior level of the capital requirements, which is reasonably high, it's 14%. And we are going to compare, just for the purposes of illustration, how the economy works with a 14% capital requirement to how the economy will work with a 7% reference capital requirement. If you wish, our current situation is closer to a 7% economy 
and our analysis suggests that there will be welfare gains actually quite important, equivalent to almost a 1% of permanent consumption, which for macro uh, conventions is a, is a huge welfare improvement by moving into higher capital requirements. This picture shows these uh, key endogenous variables I was referring to in the two economies. The red lines is the economy with low capital requirements, 7%. The blue lines, uh, also solid lines, are the ones with the 14% capital requirement. The first figure shows the value of one unit of equity. Obviously, when in the economy capital requirements are higher, for any amount of aggregate capital in the system, one unit of that capital is more valuable. Because capital is more scarce, lending, lending is, less, uh, is less abundant in the economy, marginal return to the real investments funded with bank loans is higher because this is essentially a neoclassical economy like the one of the solo model where, where, where physical capital has decreasing returns in the aggregate given that the, the amount of labor in the economy is fixed. So more scarce uh, capital means higher value of one unit of capital. But I would like to emphasize as well that for any level of capital in the system, the slope of this function, V of E, is higher with higher capital requirements. The slope gives you the intuition of how much bank capital surviving gets appreciated in value when one unit of it gets lost. And, and this is a driver of the last bank standing incentives, right? If my colleagues are losing their capital, the economy is losing its capital, surviving capital will revaluate uh, as a function of how sloppy this, this uh, how, how steep these, these curves are. So uh, actually that explains what you see in this figure. The, the, the horizontal axis is the same, but now it shows what is the fraction what is the fraction of the capital in the system invested in a systemic manner? In the economy with high capital requirements, actually for very, very low capital in the system, all loans are non-systemic. The banks want to preserve their, their wealth at any cost. Then there is some systemic risk taking. But with the 7% capital requirement, there is much more systemic risk taking. So actually for a level of capital like this, almost 80% of, of the equity in the system is exposed in the systemic lending segment. So that if the systemic shock realizes, 80% of the available capital will be lost and the credit crunch is huge. This can be represented by these phase diagrams that you can also find in the paper that shows the most important insights from the paper which relate to equity dynamics. This is equity in the system at a period T. This is equity in the system at the next period. Now, if things go well and the systemic shock does not realize, dynamics is driven by this uh, uh, blue line. But if the systemic shock realizes, then dynamics is driven by this dust line. So at a point like this, which is a crossing of the blue line with the 45 degree line, which will represent a pseudo steady state, that's where the economy keeps staying if the systemic shock does not realize. At that level, if the systemic shock occurs, we have to go the, uh, to the figure, previous figure and see 80% of the banks are giving systemic loans in that point. So if the systemic shock occurs, 80% of the equity in the system gets lost. And then the system has to start next period with much lower capital. And even if there is no further systemic shock, the economy will be suffering a credit crunch until it got, comes back to the previous uh, point. Now, in the economy with higher capital requirements, of course, the accumulated equity of the banking system is higher than there, but the level of systemic risk taking is much lower. You see this jump down when the crisis comes because the systemic risk taking in the background is much lower. And that's the great thing of the higher capital requirement. What is the bad thing? And maybe with this, I will be forced to summarize, although there are many other interesting features in the paper that you should look at in the written version, is that the capital requirements here are twice as big as there, okay? The level of accumulated equity in the system in this economy is 1.5, whatever it means. But here, you see, it is not three. It's less than 2.5. It means that the economy with twice as big capital requirements does not accumulate 
twice as much capital for the banks. So it's not able to give as many loans as the economy of the 7% capital requirement. That means that this economy is much safe, is much safer, but is giving less loans to the real economy. And GDP is lower, and actually it is lower. And in the, and in the paper, we quantify how much lower GDP is. It's 7% lower. And the industry was saying in the face of Basel III, look, you are going to produce a credit crunch. Loans are going to reduce. Uh, GDP is going to suffer. And the Basel macro assessment group was saying, no, these losses are absolutely insignificant. Our paper is midway there because we say, look, GDP losses can be important. Credit is going to suffer. Yes, 20% reduction in, cr in credit. Actually, we can compute bank credit to GDP will be lower by almost 50% of GDP. That's a lot. So it might look like this crisis with the higher capital requirements imposed after it will leave economies with less credit supply than before. Yes, but also economies in which the underlying systemic risk taking is smaller and hence welfare, which is what really matters, the, cons the consumption flaws of the agents in the economy over time can be bigger despite GDP is lower. And the key reason is because systemic crises, when they realize, destroy a lot of output, destroy a lot of physical capital, and then you cannot consume. And this is what a proper welfare analysis of capital requirements provides, right? So I haven't talked about whether we should make the gammas pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical, the model has implications for bailouts, the model has implications for transitional dynamics. If we are going to impose higher capital requirements, should we impose all of them at once or, 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 or establish a transitional period where somehow the credit crunch is smooth until we reach the new steady state? All this you can find in the paper. Thank you very much.